I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Well, it's official. I love space operas. If, God forbid, you do not know what space operas are, they are a subgenre of science fiction that mostly focuses on warfare in space, Star Wars being the best example, of course. But even though many people were introduced to the concept of space opera via Star Wars, the genre actually goes back way further than that, with films like Flash Gordon in the 30s and fanzines like La Zombie in 1941. I guess I tend to gravitate towards space opera because it seems a bit more realistic to get into military conflicts in science fiction, as opposed to time travel, which is something that I think many of us see as being too abstract from reality. Maybe that's why I like Star Trek as well, since it incorporates the space opera genre from time to time. But it wasn't until I saw a little TV show that aired briefly in 1995 that I really understood the concept. It was one of those shows that was barely noticed by viewers in its time, but has left a solid mark on the hearts of science fiction fans. I am, of course, talking about space, above and beyond. A small show that sadly never became a juggernaut, but very well could have had it been given the chance. There hasn't been a show like Space Above and Beyond since, well, ever, in my opinion. The show concerned a group of legendary military privates known as the Wild Carts, who fought against an alien species known as the Chicks, a race of religious warriors who destroyed Earth colonies for no apparent reason and began a bloodthirsty war against the human race. Unlike other sci-fi properties such as Star Wars, there were no supernatural aspects to this show. It tried to be as grounded to reality as much as possible. And with such a rich character-driven environment and compelling storylines, Space Above and Beyond had the potential to be a groundbreaking sci-fi show. But am I exaggerating? Am I looking at this show with nostalgia-clouded glasses? And would this show still work today? Let us find out in this installment of Gone, But Not Forgotten. Space Above and Beyond hit television screens on September 24, 1995, and lasted a short, tragic life of 23 glorious episodes. The show was created by high school friends Glenn Morgan and James Wong, a duo who have worked on some amazing shows together, like The X-Files and Millennium, as well as the Final Destination film franchise. Both of these guys were also separately involved in projects with alternating levels of highs and lows with Morgan being an executive producer on Jordan Peele's Twilight Zone remake, and Wong directing... No! D -d -d dragon Ball Evolution? Dear Lord, James Wong, how could you? Burn the negatives of that movie and deny any involvement in that monstrosity! Quickly, man! Save your career while there's still time! Ahem. <clears throat> anyway, after riding high from their success in the first season of The X-Files, Morgan and Wong branched out into creating their own property. And many people have accused Space Above and Beyond of being a ripoff of Starship Troopers, which I completely disagree with. Don't get me wrong, I love Starship Troopers, but that movie could be pretty goofy and corny at times. Even the original book was a bit much with its glorification of war. Wong and Morgan said that it was actually The Forever War by Joe Haldeman, which was more of an inspiration for this show. And you can totally see the similarities. Both properties deal with the effect war has on the minds of its soldiers, as well as themes of struggles with morality, and the dehumanizing aspects of warfare. Now, I'll be honest, I did not watch this show when it originally aired, and we'll get to why in a bit. I only saw it through reruns on the Sci-Fi Channel. But dear lord, this show was insanely good. And the majority of its episodes were amazing. A lot of them had some twists and turns that I never saw coming, such as finding out the truth about the murder of Captain Shane Vanson's family at the hands of evil androids called the Silicates. I won't spoil things for you, but if you had to watch only one episode of this series, I would take a chance and watch this one, which is titled The Dark Side of the Sun. 
Hell, I could make an entirely different show just talking about my favorite episodes of Space Above and Beyond. Which is why it's so unfortunate that the pilot episode sucks. I know a lot of folks are going to disagree with me, but I thought the pilot meandered quite a bit. It failed to properly set up the characters or establish the world of the show. This was eventually corrected as the series progressed, but as a first impression, it was so boring that I almost fell asleep watching it. Nevertheless, I'll go over the pilot and hopefully it won't be as much of a slog as it was when I first watched it. The show begins by introducing one of the first, if not the first, human colonies on another planet, where we hear a speech by Charles Widmore from Lost. The silence of the universe assures us that life is unique. We are alone. You and I are among the first to bring life to the stars. <laughs> This is for being an ugly Betty! While this is happening, we cut to Nathan West, played by Morgan Weiser, and his girlfriend, Kylan, who are told that only one of them can go on the next ship to colonize another planet. Nathan forces Kylan to join while he tries to stow away on board. Unfortunately, he soon discovered and kicked off the ship. Nathan then enlists in the army to eventually join Kylan, only to tragically find out that the aliens known as the Chigs have attacked her ship and taken her prisoner. This is where we meet our band of heroes. We've got the aforementioned Shane Vanson, played by the beautiful Kristen Cloak, who is enlisted in the army to honor her dead parents, who were killed in front of her and her sisters. Then we've got Paul Way, who served as the show's comic relief, as he almost always regularly threw in sarcastic quips and wisecracks. Fun fact for you, the actor who played Wang, Joel De La Fuente, wound up marrying the actress who played his love interest on the show, Melissa Bowen. Next, we've got Vanessa Damphouse, played by Lanny Chapman. Damphouse was the techie of the group, as she is very well educated and would save the team's lives many a time with her considerable knowledge. I always felt a bit bad for Chapman, as I thought her character was the most underdeveloped one on this show. Finally, we are introduced to one of the show's most popular characters, the bad boy of the group, Cooper Hawks, played by Rodney Rowland. Hawks was an escaped in vitro, which is the term for a genetically engineered human. The in vitros were a pretty interesting aspect of this show. They were adult test tube babies who were born at the age of 18. And unlike most genetically engineered characters in TV shows and films, these genetically engineered humans did not have any superpowers. They don't even have the common two donor DNA. Instead, it's almost like a blender of DNA to create optimized human beings, who are seen as a lower class from naturally born humans. At one time, they served as indentured servants, but were mostly created by the military to serve as shock troops during the war between the humans and the silicates. Hawks was ordered to join the Marines after he's arrested for attacking an in vitro racist who tried to hang him. And although he starts out as a typical bad boy stereotype, the show gives Hawks a lot of depth. He's essentially a child, since he's only been alive for a few years, and feels alienated from having no real connection to the outside world. Being a Marine seems to eventually give him a purpose, and the closest thing to a family that he had ever had, as he forms a tight bond with Colonel Tyrus Cassius, or T.C. McQueen, played by James Morrison, who is both his commander and a fellow in vitro. When word comes home of the alien attack, the government sends out the best of the best to fight the Chigs, the 127th Squadron, a.k.a. the Angry Angels who quickly get massacred. So they next deploy into battle the 58th Squadron, who are soon dubbed the Wild Cards. And so begins our space opera, science fiction warfare at its best, with not only space battles, but also ground warfare, as the 58th Squadron attempts to understand and survive against the brutal chicks. Many episodes revolved around different aspects of the war, conspiracies, bigotry within the ranks, and the temptation of losing one's humanity, just to name a few themes of the show. While the special effects for the space battles don't really hold up, the sets were really amazing. 
I especially like the loading dock where they load the ships into space. There was some real craftsmanship that went into this. I also really like the costume design. Unlike a lot of military-based science fiction, the show always looked dirty. And the cinematography was also really interesting, as it looked dark and desaturated. So much so that it was almost black and white. The music was also really amazing, which is no surprise, since it was composed by Shirley Walker. Walker was one of the first female film composers in Hollywood, with a career that spanned decades. But you would probably best know her work from Batman the Animated Series. I especially love the intro music she made for this show. It is one of those scores that is so memorable that you'll never forget it from the first moment that you hear it. The last episode of the series aired on June 2nd, 1996, and it was an amazing finale, as we got a big reveal about the Chigs, as well as the reasoning for the war. It really would have taken the show in a new direction had it gotten a second season. But what was even more frustrating was that the show ended on a cliffhanger. Well, sorta. Of. It doesn't so much end with a question as it does end on a rather somber note. Even though there are a lot of loose threads left behind, at least you do get an ending. Not one that many of us would have liked, but at least we are left with a feeling of satisfaction knowing the direction that the show would have taken. It's not something that most fans like, but I for one have seen far worse final episodes. But who would cancel this show, and why? Well, come on guys, you already know the answer. Space Above and Beyond, coming this fall to Fox. Man, should I just rename the series Fox Kills Great Shows? Anyway, you all know the excuse that Fox always uses for cancellation. Say it with me now. The rating sucked, and it was too expensive. But Morgan and Wong called bullshit on this, as they were bringing the show constantly under budget. They said that Fox kept promising to keep airing the show on a consistent night. Wong said that they were promised six weeks of airing the show in a row. But instead, the network reneged on their promises. And on top of that, Fox did no promotion for this show. And no marketing means no audience, and not being consistent with air dates means creating fan confusion, which equals low ratings. The classic Fox programming formula. It always boggles my mind that the strategy Fox, and to be fair, other networks use to help their struggling shows is always the same. Morgan and Wong said that they felt that Fox had no confidence in a show that they themselves greenlit, and did not think that a show which didn't immediately break ratings history was worth continuing. Had they only made some effort into the show, it could have been a huge moneymaker for them. But alas, it was not. Because sometimes executives don't have the courage to stand behind their decisions. In the years since the show has aired, the cast have gone on to have fulfilling lives and careers. Kristen Cloak went on to marry Glenn Morgan. James Morrison is still a character actor you always see pop up in shows like 24. And Joel De La Fuente has found great success with The Man in the High Castle. Plus, De La Fuente and Melissa Bowen are still married. So, a lot of happiness all around. Now, finally, we ask the question, should this show come back? God, yes. But it probably won't. Too much time has passed and I couldn't find anywhere to watch this show online. The only way you could really watch it is on its DVD set, which is beginning to go out of print. Still, the show has gone on to be an influence on both TV and film, so clearly it's still being appreciated, even after being cancelled far too soon. So tonight, when you look up in the sky and see a shooting star, take a minute and just imagine that it's the wild cards up there, kicking some more alien ass. I'm Jesse Shade speaking on behalf of David Arroyo for JoeBlow.com, and thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel.
tell all your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We're an independent company that appreciates all of your support. And we will see you next time for the next installment of Gone, But Not Forgotten.